Volume Two, Chapter Twelve of Celestina. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jennifer Painter. Celestina by Charlotte Turner Smith. Volume Two, Chapter Twelve. The following day they proceeded early on their journey, and Mrs. Elphinstone thus reassumed her narrative. In our way from Ealing to London, Alexander Elphinstone endeavoured by every argument in his power to strengthen my resolution, and calm those fears I expressed at meeting with my father and mother, who would, I apprehended, be enraged against me for a misfortune they had themselves taken no pains to prevent. This dreadful meeting must, however, be hazarded. I tottered as well as I was able into the dining-room, and sending for my father out of his counting-house, I put into his hands the fatal note, and informed him as well as I could of what had happened. He was too reasonable to blame me for an error he had as little foreseen himself, but hastening out of the room with Elphinston, inquired, as I afterwards learned, whether he thought Beresford meant to marry my sister. Elphinston, with some hesitation, answered that he feared not. "'Let us, then,' said he, "'endeavour to find her, and, if it be possible, hush up this unhappy affair before it becomes more known.' Elphinston most willingly agreed to assist him in the search, and my elder brother was sent for from the temple for the same purpose. His anger and indignation were much more turbulent than my father's. He vowed vengeance against Beresford, and set out in pursuit of him in such a temper of mind as made me dread the consequence should he find him. To find him, however, every effort proved abortive. Among other places, my Mr. Elphinstone went to inquire for him at the lodgings his elder brother had taken in Piccadilly that squire received him with that contemptuous coldness which he thought was all he owed to a merchant's clerk and upon his eager inquiry after beresford and learning the reason of it he said what a fuss is here indeed about a little grisette why one would think beresford had carried off an heiress let him alone and i dare say he will bring her back again his brother enraged at this insult spoke to him very freely which he returned no otherwise than by calling him quill driver and macaroni of mincing lane the brothers parted in wrath and the younger returned home lamenting his fruitless search and devising new measures for the next day these however were equally successless poor emily was lost to us for ever and the feeble hope that Beresford might have married her every day became fainter. This unhappy affair put an end to our intercourse with the Elphinstone family, and was indeed the first signal of a long, long series of calamities. I observed that my father grew extremely uneasy at something that related to the situation of his affairs. He began to complain that Mr. Elphinstone's remittances fell very short of what he expected, that he was paid no interest for the large sums he had advanced for him, and while he was deliberating how to get out of the difficulties these circumstances threw him into, he received information that Mr. Elphinstone, deeply involved before, had been overwhelmed by the expenses of his eldest son, and the failure of his remittances, had gone off in the night from his house at Ealing to Falmouth, whence he had embarked in the packet for Antigua, while his lady and family had shut up their houses at Ealing and in Cavendish Square, and were gone to Bath. These terrible tidings fell on my father like a stroke of thunder, and for some time he was unable to attempt applying any remedy to the evils he saw gathering around him. But from the torpor of immediate anguish, he was roused by the pressing demands of those, of whom he had on his own security borrowed money for the supply of Mr. Elphinstone. It was at a season when many months were to intervene before he could receive any remittances from his co-respondent, 
even if his correspondent should have honour enough to send them and bankruptcy and ruin seemed inevitable he had however as he thought a friend in a very eminent banker who a few months before on his engaging so largely with mr elphinstone had heard some report that that gentleman had influenced him in favour of the banker with whom he was connected on which my father's friend a man of immense property had then written to him thus my dear sir the intimation i have this day received of your connection about to be formed with mr elphinstone is the occasion of this address it would be injurious to that friendship you so constantly profess towards me to doubt a moment that to have an occasion of serving me would be a real pleasure to your good self from a conversation between mr elphinstone and my brother peter who were acquainted by meeting at the house of sibley and co i am very apprehensive we run the risk of losing a connection so pleasing to me by his influence and inclination to another house upon your friendship dear sir i rely to save me from so great a mortification and concern as i flattered myself the connection between your house and ours was formed for many many years let your goodness towards me therefore prevent your other connections from breaking it and i hope your friendship for me admits of no diminution as mine towards you never will assuredly my very best and sincerest wishes waits in the meantime on worthy mrs cathcart your good self and every member of your amiable family who am my dear sir your most sincere and faithful friend and obliged humble servant timothy heavyland london january the thirtieth seventeen blank to this affectionate and sincere gentleman whom my father had instantly obliged in dropping all thoughts of complying with elphinstone's request he now wrote and describing with great simplicity his present embarrassment which he hoped would be only temporary besought him to advance him five hundred pounds for the present demands of tradesmen till remittances came in and till he could obtain assistance from his other friends to which he received the following answer sir yours is come to hand our house on making up your book find they have already advanced you two hundred and sixteen pounds eighteen shillings and tuppence four above your credit we hoped you would have made this up by payments forthwith instead of asking for a loan a sorry it is not in our power to comply therewith i cannot take upon myself to advise them thereto as i find myself blamed for being the occasion of the present advance and that our house are uneasy at the non-payment thereof hope you will think immediately of replacing it and will oblige thereby sir your humble servant timothy heavyland the eyes of my poor father were now completely opened and all the horrors of his fate were before him young elphinstone still sanguine as to his father's property and his father's honour was on this occasion his great resource he was indefatigable in stemming the torrent of ill fortune thus brought upon us and succeeded so well by various expedients as to support for a while the sinking credit of the house but seeing my father become every day more and more anxious and doubtful about the elder mr elphinstone he proposed to go over to antigua himself and to this proposal added that of marrying me and taking me with him my father who found his health giving way under the accumulated calamities that had lately befallen him now thought it better to accept this proposal and by a union of families make it mr elphinstone's interest to be just we were married then after a reluctant consent wrung from the haughty mother of my lover and three weeks afterwards embarked for the west indies i was not yet old enough to consider the situation of our fortune with any great concern but i parted from my own father with a sad presentiment that we were to meet no more and i dreaded my introduction to the father of my husband but i loved him he was the most cheerful and sanguine creature in the world 
and painted to me only scenes of prosperity and happiness which i was well pleased to contemplate as true representations gracious heaven could i then have foreseen all the misery that was in store for me how should i have shrunk from a destiny so insupportable how should i have wished that in a violent storm we met in the bay of biscay we might perish we arrived however after a tedious passage at antigua and i was relieved from the discomforts of a long voyage to encounter as i believed what i dreaded more the disdain and rudeness of my father-in-law i landed trembling with this apprehension disgusted with everything i saw and overcome with heat and sickness but the first intelligence we heard was that mr elphinston had been dead about a week of an epidemical distemper and that his houses and plantations were in the possession of the agents of his eldest son it was in vain that my husband desired to be admitted to reside on one of them till he could see into his father's affairs the people who had been placed there refused him any satisfaction and it was only by applying to the governor that he at length obtained a sight of the will by which he found that his father had left everything to his elder brother and an annuity to his mother of eight hundred a year with five thousand pounds to each of his daughters and to his youngest son but as the estates were not charged with these last legacies nor able to pay them if it had his nominal fortune gave him but little comfort nor alleviated the concern with which he saw too evidently that all the sums of money lent by my father to his were entirely lost the pain this gave him the incessant fatigue to which he exposed himself in going to granada and st vincent's where his father had made purchases at length overcame the natural strength of his constitution after we had been about four months in the west indies living with his friends he was seized at granada with one of those fevers so common in that climate an old french lady who lived on her own estate near the lonely habitation where he was taken ill had pity upon him took him to her house and by her extraordinary care carried him through the disorder but he was very long in a state of infantine weakness and could articulate nothing but a request that he might see his wife it was some time before i received intelligence of his situation and some time longer before i could get to him the kindness of our foreign friend did not stop there i was now in a state which excited her generous compassion towards me and she insisted that instead of returning to europe in a situation so unfit for a voyage i should stay with her till the birth of my child poor elphinstone's weak condition of health indeed rendered such a voyage as impracticable for him as for me we accepted therefore the generous hospitality of madame du molinet and at her house in granada my eldest child was born during the five months we remained there we heard that the elder brother was come over himself to antigua and had taken possession of everything we had therefore no business to go back where we had no authority nor indeed any provision but as soon as our hostess would give us leave embarked again to return to england more destitute than we had left it and with a little unfortunate baby to share our distresses we arrived there after an absence of thirteen months and hastened to london as cheaply as we could for we had very little money my poor elphinstone left me at the inn where we stopped and went to my father's house never shall i forget the look with which he returned to me his bloodless cheeks his wild eyes his trembling lips spoke before he could utter a syllable he sat down looked earnestly on me a moment then on his child which was sleeping in my arms started up ran from us staggered towards the wainscot and fell 
my screams brought the people of the inn into our miserable room they took up the unhappy young man and gave him what assistance they could supposing that he had fallen into a fit after a moment he recovered his speech and entreating to be left alone with me told me that my father was dead insolvent all his effects sold and my mother-in-law gone to reside with her relations in the north and tis i have undone thee my sophie cried he tis i and my family who have reduced thee to beggary and now i have not a place wherein to shelter thee and this dear hapless innocent agony now choked his utterance and all my resolution was necessary to prevent his relapsing into the state he had just recovered from stifling therefore my own anguish i besought him to take courage declared that i feared nothing while he was with me and well and urged him to think of some place where we might pass the night and recover courage to encounter what was before us he seemed comforted by my calmness and recollected an old servant of his father's who kept a lodging-house in northumberland street thither we determined to go the man was gone from hence but some other people who let lodgings now inhabited the house they had a bedchamber on the second floor to let and knowing something of us took us in fatigue of body overcame for a short time the agony of mind my poor husband had felt he was asleep by me my infant was at my breast but i could not sleep all the horrors of poverty were before me and my agitated spirit ran over every hope which yet remained for us but rested securely on none the morning at last came and i now desired elphinstone to inquire out my eldest brother who when we went away had chambers in the temple and to discover what was become of my dear frank whom we had left at school and to whom i was always fondly attached poor emily too recurred to me but for her alas i dared not inquire he went out therefore after breakfast and returned in about an hour with looks that gave me no favourable impression of his success my eldest brother he told me had left his chambers and had been married some months to a young woman of some fortune at least in expectancy being the only child of her parents with whom they lived and that her father an attorney of practice in warwick court hoban had taken my brother into his business i saw him however said elphinstone but he received me so coldly that i shall hardly repeat the visit my heart sunk cold within me and i had hardly courage to ask what was become of frank he is at i know not what academy replied elphinstone your brother john told me very coolly that though he was so lucky as to have a provision by marriage himself it was out of his power to provide for all his father's family and thought it quite enough that he had been at so much expense for frank who must now said he do something for himself for i cannot undertake to pay his schooling another year and you sir as it is owing to your family that my father was ruined i hope you will now take this burthen off my hands for my wife's family are very much discontented at my bearing it gracious god cried i what will become of us oh my poor baby why wert thou ever born to embitter our calamities cried elphinstone rather ask my sophie why i was ever born who brought them upon thee and on that dear little victim we had so little money left that it was necessary to think of something directly elphinstone therefore went out again to inquire after his mother and his sisters from some of those families who had during their splendour been the fondest of their society and the most frequently at their house among these was one lady who had always professed the greatest affection in the world for them all never spoke to mrs elphinstone but as her dear friend nor to her children under any other appellation than her sweet creatures 
or her amiable young friends elphinstone gave me as nearly as he could the words in which she answered his inquiry why my dear dear sir you must think how shocked and amazed i was your poor good mother to be sure i had a most sincere regard for her and your sisters too good sweet young women so amiable so accomplished i'm amazed they never married well poor things god knows to be sure what is best for us what is is right as pope observes but dear madam i must beg to learn where my mother and sisters are i am but just come from the ship that brought me back to england is it possible poor young gentleman i am sure i wish i could inform you of anything agreeable you don't know then perhaps that everything in cavendish square and at ealing was sold under executions as i heard but i heartily hope it was not so such a respectable family and so many fine young people and your poor good mother i saw her at bath last winter after those disagreeable affairs and was sorry to see that she had lost a great deal of her cheerfulness to be sure that was not to be wondered at i told her how sincerely i wished her a pleasant voyage poor worthy woman after being compelled to listen to a great deal more of this fulsome cant he at length learned that one of his sisters boarded with an apothecary's family at bath being in an ill state of health and that his mother and the other two sisters finding mr elphinstone who was distinguished as squire squashy little disposed to do them justice had by advice of their friends embarked for antigua so that we probably passed them at sea this was terrible every resource seemed to fail us and in a few days famine was likely to stare us in the face my beloved brother frank however was among all my own distresses ever near my heart and i determined for his sake and because i would leave nothing unattempted for elphinstone and my child to go myself to my eldest brother to implore the kindliness of one and obtain a sight of the other i said nothing however to elphinstone of this intention fearing he might oppose it i set forth alone with my baby in my arms for i could not leave it nor could i afford to hire a coach i rapped at the door and inquiring for mr cathcart was told by the footman who opened it that i might wait in the passage and he would see in the passage i waited some minutes and was then told that mr cathcart was busy with some gentlemen and that i must send in my business and call again ah mr mornay you have no relations i think nor can ever nor ever will i hope feel how sharper than a serpent's tooth it is to meet cruelty and scorn from those to whom the sick heart looks for pity and protection i was unwilling to send in my name and a verbal message as there were people with him i therefore sat down on a bench where porters and servants sit in those passages and wrote with a pencil it is your sister sophie who cannot call again this brought out the great man for great he suddenly was become his likeness to my father the tender recollection that he was my brother made me forget all his unkindness the moment i saw him and i was throwing myself and my child into his arms when a cold how do you do mrs elphinstone fixed me to the place i suppose he thought by my looks that i should faint and was afraid of it being exposed to his servants and new relations for he took my hand faintly kissed my cheek and leading me into a little dark parlour where there was no fire and desired me to sit down some remains of natural affection which in a young man is very rarely totally extinguished seem to be contending with pride avarice and mean policy and for a while kept him silent he then inquired coldly into our situation and as i related it for he had no idea it was so bad i saw those affections gradually shrink from the detail 
his heart seemed to become harder as its tenderness became more necessary and he declared to me at last that i had formed erroneous ideas of his situation if i thought it was in his power to be of any service to me i rose to go but desired a direction to frank which he gave me very unwillingly for since i could contribute nothing to his support he thought it useless for me to see him i do not now very well know how i got out of the house of this cruel brother who never introduced me to his family or seemed to wish to see me again but i recollect that when i came into holborn i became so very faint and sick that i was obliged to get into a coach to return home which i paid for by changing the last guinea i had in the world ah my dear miss de mornay veteran in sorrow as i have been since i look back with wonder on the scene i afterwards passed through i wonder how i supported it we lingered on for three months at these lodgings my beloved frank often and always happy to be with us he was now near sixteen very tall and very manly and repeatedly declared to elphinston that he was well able to get his bread or to assist him in any way of business he could enter into business however was not to be obtained without money but my father's creditors knowing how well elphinston was acquainted with his affairs engaged him to assist them in recovering debts due to him and allowed him from time to time some very trifling compensation which was our only support as long however as he was well as long as my little boy blessed me by its innocent smiles i murmured at nothing and the little time i could spare from nursing him and after he was in his cradle of a night i found exquisite pleasure in applying those little arts i had learnt as matters of amusement to the purposes of profit they produced not much but in our situation everything was a help and our simple meal partly the produce of my industry and shared with my brother frank after elphinston came home of a night was infinitely a sweeter banquet than the insipid though splendid tables of the affluent had formerly afforded me at length however the persecution of ill fortune which seemed to have relaxed a little began anew and misery fell upon me where i could least bear it elphinston was seized again with an infectious fever differing only from that he had at granada in the symptoms occasioned by difference of climate on his attendance on the creditors our daily and scanty subsistence depended with his confinement every aid of that sort ceased and i saw him languishing in a sick-bed in all the depression of a malignant fever without the means of giving him the necessary assistance a neighbouring apothecary however attended him who told me that wine was absolutely necessary to be given him in large quantities where was i to get it for the first time i had recourse to a pawnbroker and my dear dear frank was my agent for now attached entirely to us he quitted his school where indeed he knew more than the master and gave himself up wholly to our service while my brother john not sorry to be relieved from the expense of supporting him remonstrated or rather quarrelled with him once and obtaining an excuse for shaking him off saw him no more i had a watch and a few trinkets these were first disposed of and then such clothes as i could spare for i could not endure the thoughts of taking anything that belonged to elphinston though my trembling heart too often whispered that he would want them no more youth and the strength of his constitution carried him on many days through a rapid and generally fatal distemper and at length my fainting courage was sustained by the hope of his recovery when my lovely infant was seized with the same terrible disorder and i was told that as it was almost always fatal to children i must not hope i know not then what became of me but i think that for some hours i was not in my senses i recollect being seized with an earnest wish to have my child attended by a physician 
i had heard named as eminent for his humanity as for his peculiar skill in this disorder and as frank was not at that moment with us i wrapped myself in an old cloak and leaving my poor infant to the care of his father who was just able to sit by the cradle and look at him with eyes of hopeless agony i went away myself to implore this physician to come to us and had just sense enough to remember the direction i had received to his house but none to notice the objects around me or to care what people might think who saw me with wild looks and uncertain steps hurrying through the crowd of the busy and the happy i had proceeded as far as the corner of cecil street when a crowd of carriages and passengers impeded the crossing i was making my way through them heedless of the danger and hardly hearing the noise when a footman in a livery glittering with lace stopped me and told me he was ordered by his lady to beg i would step to the door of her carriage and speak to her oh i cannot i cannot indeed replied i without inquiring who his lady was my child my child is ill i am going for advice for him i would have passed the man but he followed me and pointed to an elegant vis-a-vis -vis that was drawn up close to the broad pavement here is my lady ma'am said the man i looked up it was my emily my long lost lamented emily i gave a faint shriek and hardly heard her in a low and tremulous voice articulate my sister my sister sophie not quite in my senses when i left my lodgings this interview quite robbed me of them i caught hold of the door of the carriage or i should have fallen in the street every object swam before me and i retained only recollection enough to cry my child my child save my child and to hear emily repeat what child what can i do for you good heaven what can i do for you but i was unable to answer i found myself however in a few moments placed in the carriage and emily holding her salts to my nose and chafing my temples when my senses returned my child was their first object and again i exclaimed oh do not do not detain me i must go to save my child my poor little boy my dear dear sister cried emily pray summons your recollection and tell me whither you would go we will drive to the place directly in my anxiety for the life of my infant i forgot the culpable conduct of my sister and telling her where the physician lived she gave orders to her coachman to hasten thither instantly a strange stupor overwhelmed me i could not speak till we came to the door of the house i then looked out i would have flown out of the carriage he was not at home but just as we were leaving the door he drew up to it then my voice and recollection returned to me i besought him most earnestly to go with me he was at that moment come from his first round of visits to change his horses and begged we would wait a few moments but emily urged him so earnestly to get into her carriage saying she would take him to my lodgings and bring him back that he could not resist her importunity he went with us then and so totally was my mind absorbed in the danger of my child that i heeded not the strange contrast between my appearance and the gay splendour of my sister i forgot what she was and almost who she was and only inquired when the physician had seen my child whether he would live i saw by his looks his opinion to the contrary nor indeed did he attempt to conceal it but he besought me to attend to my own health and to that of my husband gave directions about us all and departed with my sister refusing the fee i offered him and telling me he would come again early the next day elphinston amazed as he was at the scene that had passed had no power to inquire the meaning of it and i had none to explain it all my resolution was roused to attend my dying infant but all could not save him he died and now i tell it with dry eyes though when it beset me i thought no blow could be so severe and that i could not survive it 
for since the birth of cain the first male child to him that did but yesterday suspire never was such a gracious creature born yet i have lived now above ten years longer my dear miss de mornay and have learnt that there are such evils in life as make an early death a blessing i was delirious i know not how long between the excess of my affliction and the opiates that were given me to deliver me a while from the sense of my misery in the meantime my sister sent a careful person to attend me and saw me every day herself though i no longer knew her or anybody but elphinstone whose hand i held for hours imploring him not to let them take my child from me emily did yet more she supplied us with everything we wanted attended herself to the funeral of my poor baby and then took lodgings for us at kensington that we might be removed from the place where we had suffered so much calamity in her frequent visits she spoke not either to elphinstone or frank unless they first spoke to her and never but on the subjects of my health and ease i was not yet quite restored to my senses when we removed she sent us by a porter the next day a forty-pound note with these words my ever dear sophie having been lucky enough to be of some use to you i rejoice that we have met but now if our future meetings should be unpleasant to you it depends entirely on you whether they shall be repeated whatever may be my failings or my errors i trust that among them will never be reckoned want of love to my relations whether they will acknowledge or no your still affectionate emily as soon as i was capable of reading and understand this all that had passed came back to my recollection i had been supported then for many days by the wages of shame and now had nothing but a gift from the same hand to save my husband my brother and myself from actual hunger oh my dear father cried i can you forgive your unfortunate child or rather your unfortunate children and ought i to refuse taking this lovely lost one whose heart so generous so full of sensibility cannot surely be quite hardened in a course of evil i shall tire you my dear madam if i am so minute suffice it to say that i saw my sister that she owned all her guilt and all her folly without having the power or at that time perhaps the wish to quit a manner of life where she possessed boundless splendour and luxury for such a precarious subsistence as women can earn in business my remonstrances she heard with gentleness and mingled her tears with mine but she pleaded gratitude to the friend who supported her and the impossibility of her abandoning him or existing if she did i was afraid of inquiring who this was but i found that it was some man of high rank who had taken her from the worthless beresford and with whom she had lived ever since her purpose seemed to be to detach my thoughts as much as possible from her situation and to fix them on my own and indeed it was very necessary for we had now in consequence of elphinstone's long illness no support whatever but what her tenderness afforded us as elphinstone recovered his health his sanguine temper returned and again he formed various projects of entering into business it was now the midst of the american troubles and some part of my father's property which was thought recoverable was there elphinstone who now from long habit and from his natural disposition was become unsettled and fond of speculative schemes proposed to the creditors to go over there in search of these sums i was still too ill and too much depressed by past sufferings to give very minute attention to this plan i only resolved not to be left behind but to share his destiny whatever it might be in a fortnight or three weeks he was every day in town and the latter part of that time returned in remarkably gay spirits and told me of i know not what prospects that were opening to him to which indifferent to everything beyond a mere subsistence now that i had lost my boy and long accustomed to hear a visionary fortune i gave very little applause 
till he came home one day elated beyond what I had ever seen before, and told me that an offer had that day been made to him to become a sort of under-secretary to a man high in administration, into whose house he was to be taken, that he was to enter on his place the following week, had taken a lodging for me in the neighbourhood, and hired two female servants and a footman to attend. I wondered at, and rather blamed his precipitancy, but he assured me he was right. Frank went with us, as he was to be a sort of secretary, in his turn, to Elphinstone, who was now domesticated with his patron, while my brother and I were in very handsome lodgings in Westminster. I do not know by what means the money came, but from this time it was as plenty with Elphinstone as it had before been scarce. In a few months his views were so much enlarged that he took a house for me, increased the number of his servants, and from one thing to another our establishment was at length on a footing of splendour, against which I remonstrated in vain. He assured me that his future success depended on his keeping up such an appearance, that the emoluments of his place fully entitled him to it, and that I should soon see him permanently fixed in a situation such as would put us out of the power of fortune. In the meantime, as I never loved London, and as my health was very much hurt by a long continuance in it, I prevailed on him to let me have a small house at Sheen, near Richmond, where it would not be necessary, for me at least, to be always in company, which began to be unavoidable in London. To this proposal he consented at first with reluctance, but afterwards I thought he was not sorry to have his house in town at liberty to receive the parties he now made there, by which it became distinguished for good cheer and high living. I had by this time two boys, one of whom I have since lost, and the other is the eldest of these, and with many a silent and stifled sigh I wished their father would think, while in this prosperous train of fortune, of making some provision for his increasing family. He heard me always with his usual good temper, and as constantly assured me that he was laying by money every year, though I never could guess how or from whence it came. Frank, however, was not only supported like a gentleman, but had really more money than, had he been less prudent and steady, would have been proper for so young a man. Of this, notwithstanding the infectious example of the people among whom he lived, and even of Elphinstone himself, he always brought a part to me to put by for him. On these occasions I sometimes questioned him of their manner of life in London, whence I now entirely absented myself, and though he gave me such answers as would, he thought, prevent my inquietude, he was too ingenuous to be able to conceal the whole truth. Thus my prosperity was embittered by the fear of falling again into the adversity from which we had been delivered by miracle, and I lived in perpetual dread of evils I had no power to prevent. Alas, the greatest evil was already arrived, the estrangement of Elphinstone's heart. I saw it in a thousand instances, but I knew that reproaches and importunity would not recall it, and I endeavoured, whenever he came down to Sheen, to appear cheerful, lest he should be quite won from me by those whom he now frequented. Though he has an excellent understanding, he became insensibly intoxicated with his good fortune, and never gave himself time to think how soon it might be at an end, till this fatal period actually arrived. His patron was dismissed from his employment, and the golden dream vanished at once. I knew then that out of immense sums of money he had made, by means of which I understand nothing, he had not reserved five hundred pounds, and I knew that a mistress whom he had supported in great splendour had pillaged him of twenty times that sum. But he was now humbled and unhappy. I forgave all his failings, and should have blessed the chance that had restored him to me, had we but a competence to live upon. After all our plate and fine furniture in London was sold, and our debts called in, 
we found ourselves about two hundred pounds worse than nothing but elphinstone still told me he had friends and now commenced a course of felicitation and attendance to which the humblest and severest labour is in my mind infinitely preferable and in the meantime our subsistence was derived from his writing for the papers and now and then by an eighteenpenny political pamphlet i did not notice that in the height of our prosperity my brother john assiduously courted our regard and elphinstone had procured him many advantages among others that of being steward to a nobleman by whom he made a great deal of money so that he was on our decline more prosperous than ever with our failure however his love failed also and all we could now obtain of him was to take frank as a sort of assistant into his business my poor emily who from gratitude and pity i could never wholly forsake was at this time abroad with her friend and i had nothing to support me against the heavy tide of adversity but the consciousness of having done my duty and the firm reliance on heaven which that consciousness gave me four years we lingered on sometimes flattered by hope of some trifling place and sometimes supported by small remittances from elphinstone's mother while she complained heavily of the conduct of her eldest son who had deprived her and his sisters of everything he could take from them oh never may those who have it in their power to secure an independence foolishly throw it away and trust to the fallacious assurances of that friendship which flourishes only in the sunshine of affluence day after day did poor elphinstone now attend those men who but a few months ago were his assiduous friends many into whose pockets he had been the means of putting thousands now shut their doors against him while of those who could not so easily escape from his importunity some blamed him for the expense at which he had lived talked of the advantages of economy and of the demands of their own family others very gravely harangued on the caprice of fortune the ups and downs of the world thanked god they had but a little but that little was they hoped secure yet most truly lamented that it was too little to enable them to follow the warm dictates of their hearts in aiding a friend they so much respected and esteemed and with this sort of language bowed him out whose favour and recommendation they had only a few months before solicited with meanness equal to their present ingratitude wearied at length by this sad experience of a world to which he was still too much attached and where from the vivacity of his sanguine temper he was long unwilling to relinquish the hope of rising again into consideration he took up once more his old projects of recovering the money due to his father in america and though that country was no longer under the government of britain and his expectations of success greatly diminished he contrived to persuade those persons who were interested to furnish him with a small supply of money and we went a wandering and unhappy family to america i could give you my dear mr mornay a long detail of our pilgrimage of our being once fixed on a farm in the back settlements and exposed to terrors from the indians which with all my courage it was utterly out of my power to support but i have already been too prolix and tired you with a long history of sorrow from which your sensible heart requires some relief alas i cannot give it you while i dwell on my own sad story i will therefore as briefly as i can conclude it by telling you that we were four years in america and two in antigua where my husband joined his own family and tried to establish himself as a merchant but he was by this time considered as a schemer as an unlucky man as one not born to be prosperous and this design ended like the rest in disappointment i have obtained however some advantages by my itinerant life i have learnt resignation and have seen that almost every condition of humanity has evils equal to mine 
though I have sometimes thought them insupportable. But in acquiring patience, hope, I own, has escaped me, nor have I now any other wish than to see my children well and to be able to find them bred. The distinctions of rank have long since, too, been lost to me, who have passed from competence to extreme poverty, from extreme poverty to high affluence, and have again fallen to all the miseries of dependence and indigence. When Frank, therefore, first declared to me his attachment to Jessie Woodburn, I opposed his marriage, not from pride, but from the apprehension of redoubling his difficulties. I then, it is true, depended almost entirely on the generous assistance of that excellent brother, but, believe me, that would never have induced me to oppose what was requisite to his happiness. I had not known Jessie long before I lost every idea of opposition to it, and I wished to see them married long before I knew what favourable prospects might one day open to the object of his affection. To foresee to whom she would owe the realising those prospects, to whom she would afterwards be the means of my being known, was, you know, impossible. "'And where, my dear madam?' inquired Celestina. "'Where was Mr. Elphinstone at the time you speak of?' "'He was gone again to Antigua on account of his mother's death. "'I was left with four children and so little money "'that heaven only knows what would have become of them and of me "'had it not been for Frank.' "'And your sister Emily? "'I cannot help being interested for her with all her failings.' ah would to heaven i knew what was now her lot i lost all traces of her after my going to america nor could mine or frank's most assiduous inquiries ever since gain any intelligence she has changed her name or taken some other means to avoid us circumstances that make me fear she is sunk below her former brilliant but discreditable and destructive condition when i think of her and of my children my stoicism forsakes me, and of her, unless I could snatch her from a manner of life so terrible, I endeavour not to think, for the thoughts of what she is, and of what she may be, I am very frequently unable to bear. You will allow, my dear Miss de Mornay, that my own situation requires all my courage. A new and perhaps an abortive project now carries me to the remotest part of Scotland, with a heart, I hope not callous, but exhausted by long suffering. My husband is amiable, good-tempered, and I believe truly attached to me, but he is so volatile, so unsteady, misfortune has made him restless, and his desultory life increased the original blemish of his temper, a want of firmness, from which have arisen some of the evils that have pursued us. One of his sometime friends, procured him the little appointment he now holds, rather to get rid of his importunity, I think, than to do him real service. It may, however, afford us a residence and a support, and I need not say that its distance from the scene of our former prosperity and former adversity is to me its greatest recommendation. If my husband can learn to be content among the cold and dreary Hebrides, if my children have their health food and shelter never shall i be heard to repine and indeed my journey in having you for my companion begins under auspices so favourable that my heart dead to hope as it has long been is yet not insensible of something that nearly resembles it this conversation brought the travellers to the end of their third day's stage and celestina more than ever interested for mrs elphinstone forgot for a moment everything but the series of undeserved calamities to which she had been listening. End of chapter 12 End of the second volume Volume 3, Chapter 1 of Celestina This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Florence Short Celestina by Charlotte Turner Smith Volume 3, 
Chapter One At the end of a week, Celestina, with Mrs. Elphinstone and her children, were arrived at the small village of Kirby Thorn, where, as the youngest of the little boys had appeared the preceding day to droop, his mother determined to pass the night. Celestina, who saw her friend greatly alarmed by the indisposition of the child, endeavoured to appease her fears by imputing it to the fatigue and heat of their journey. But the terrified mother saw every moment new grounds for her apprehensions, and the next day the child was evidently much worse. Four and twenty hours more passed in painful solicitude, and then Mrs. Elphinstone knew that it was the measles, and became much easier, though the eldest boy had every symptom of having taken the same disorder. Mrs. Elphinstone never left her children a moment and Celestina, with the tenderest solicitude, assisted her. The elder boy was of a sanguine and irritable constitution, and the eruptive fever ran high, while the situation there were in, at a little inn where the servants and children of the house had not had the distemper, was rendered extremely uncomfortable by the fears of its other inhabitants, the murmurs of the landlady, and the reluctance of the servants celestina with that cheerful benignity which was on all occasions ready for the service of the distressed now acted for her friend almost the part of a servant and in her frequent visits to the kitchen for what was wanted in the sick-room she saw three servants a postillion and two footmen and observed that they seemed fixed there and were not at present travelling the men were remarkably well behaved and observing the discontent of the people in the inn had more than once offered to go out for her on any messages might have occasion to send the mind of celestina was however too much occupied by the little invalids to suffer her curiosity to be awakened by the circumstance and she never inquired to whom these servants nor a very plain but fashionable post-chaise about what she saw them sometimes busied belonged the children were in the height of the distemper and the anxious mother and celestina entirely occupied about them when a very decent person about fifty who had the look of a housekeeper to some person of fashion came to the door of their room which was left open for the sake of air and asking permission to come in told them that her lady lady horatia howard had ordered her to wait on them to inquire if her servants or anything in her power could contribute to the ease of the children or the ladies to whom they belonged mrs elphinstone returned a proper answer to this very polite and humane message and after the person who delivered it was withdrawn celestina pausing a moment said that she recollected the name of lady horatia howard and that she was one of the friends most esteemed among the numerous acquaintances cultivated by mrs willoughby it was now debated between them whether after so obliging a message celestina should not make herself known to lady horatia mrs elphinstone was inclined to think she ought but celestina seemed rather disposed to avoid it it is true said she that i recollect my dear mrs willoughby to have been very partial to her but it is probable that she has long since forgotten me and that i shall be exposed to the disagreeable necessity of announcing myself and recalling to her mind circumstances which i cannot remember but with pain perhaps too she may know the strange occurrences which have since happened and though i remember her conversation to have been very refined and elegant perhaps she may expect if she honours me with her notice that i should prove myself worthy of it by relating all that has happened for who knows in what light the castle norse may have represented my conduct i am unequal to all this i fear and unless to avail myself of our former acquaintance will be of any use to you my dear mrs elphinstone i shall not for my own sake only endeavour to renew it in a few hours afterwards however lady horatia who had heard from her servant of the fine form and amiable manners of the young person who was so attentive to the sick children contrived to have a door left open by which she must pass and seeing her immediately knew her on her return into the room therefore lady horatia sent her woman again with her compliments begging to know if the name of one of the ladies was not de mornay and if it was requesting the favour of speaking to her celestina could not now decline going and following the messenger was shewn into the room where lady horatia sat alone 
pardon me dear miss de mornay cried she the moment she entered if instead of waiting on you i request to see you here the truth is i am foolishly affected by the sight of illness that which has attacked your little friends is not however i hope dangerous celestina who by the freedom and kindness of this address was immediately relieved from some little uneasiness which she had felt from this unexpected interview answered with all her usual ease and grace and lady horatia who seemed extremely pleased with having met her inquired after lady molyneux and such other of their former friends as she thought would renew no unpleasing recollections for though she did not know all that had happened she was well aware how cruel a blow the death of mrs willoughby had been to celestina and had heard some confused reports that the marriage of willoughby and miss fitzhaman was interrupted by his prior attachment to his mother's ward but she knew not how far selina had been preferred to the haughty heiress and though she had always a partial kindness to her when she used to meet her at mrs willoughby's she had lost sight of her entirely afterwards and after some inquiries concluded she was gone back to france the sight of her now at a remote inn in the north was as agreeable as it was unexpected and though the difference of their ages seemed to preclude any great degree of intimacy before for lady horatia was past the middle of life yet now she felt herself strongly disposed to cultivate pleasure thus thrown in her way celestina could not be insensible of the honour she derived from the notice of a person more eminent for her goodness and her talents than her birth or her fortune and always pleasing she grew infinitely more so where she desired to please in a few hours therefore they became so happy with each other that lady horatia could not part with her but with regret and celestina would have left her with reluctance on any other occasion than to attend the children of her friend which during her absence mrs hemmings lady horatia's woman had done with an attention that prevented mrs elphinstone suffering from the engagement of celestina with her lady the children became better and their mother easier lady horatia saw and liked her and invited both her and celestina to give her as much of their time as they could spare from the little convalescents in consequence of this invitation they were now a good deal with her and mrs elphinstone on some occasion expressing how fortunate she thought herself that in so remote a place she had the honour of becoming known to her lady horatia said smiling and i dare say you think it very extraordinary too my dear madam for unless you had known me before it would be difficult to account for my being here did you never remark that unhappiness makes people restless oh yes very often replied mrs elphinstone with a sigh it has had that effect on me said lady horatia and satiated with everything in what is called the world where i have passed the greater part of my life i often leave it and ramble about careless of everything but change of place my old faithful servants and a few books being the sole companions of my travels i have for these last four or five years given up my house in the country and passed all the summer in wandering about switzerland france and england this year i am going to scotland for no other reason than because i have not been there before at this village one of my horses fell lame and as it was indifferent to me where i was i agreed to my servant's request of staying here a day or two while i waited you arrived here and i own very sincerely that i became interested for the children and for the ladies such as hemmings described them to me i hope we shall none of us be sorry for the accidents that detained us here when the little boys are quite well as i am persuaded they will be now in a few days they will have passed happily through a very troublesome distemper and i think you will each of you have added a friend to your stock the advantage however will be still more evidently mine for i hope to have added two a few days confirmed the good opinion which lady horatia entertained of her new acquaintance and her acquaintance of her if she was particularly attached to celestina it was because she was young enough to be her daughter and because she told her that she could not look at her especially when she was reading or employed in anything that gave a serious cast to her features without remarking her likeness to a person she had once fondly loved celestina whose thoughts were perpetually fixed on the strange mystery which hung over her birth and who caught at everything likely to clear it up blushed deeply the first time she made this remark 
and asked whether this person was a foreigner lady horatia sighed in her turn and said no it was a brother of hers who had not been long dead he was a soldier said she and lost his life in america in that war which tore it from the british empire judge yourself of the likeness though i well know it must be accidental she then took out of her travelling trunk a little filigreed casket in which were several valuable trinkets and several pictures three were the portraits of gentlemen come said lady horatia to prove whether this resemblance is merely a chimera of mine let us ask mrs elphinstone if among these pictures she sees one which is like anybody she knows for my dear miss de mornay do you know this similitude of countenance struck me when you were a child with mrs willoughby and now that your features are more formed it is in my mind wonderfully strong but my sweet friend why do you appear so uneasy i cannot very well tell replied celestina trying to force a smile i am sure to bear a resemblance to anybody dear to your ladyship must be ever pleasing to me though i well know that it must be as you observe quite accidental mrs elphinstone then coming in lady horatia shewed her the three portraits come tell us mrs elphinstone if you know any living friend whom either of these portraits resembles mrs elphinstone took them and looked steadily a moment on each then fixing on one she looked more intently first on that and then on celestina indeed i think i do cried she i surely see a resemblance a very strong resemblance between this picture and miss de mornay bless me how very like the shape of the face the mouth the dark brown eyebrow the colour of the eyes the setting on the hair round the forehead and temples except that it is less fair that the features are proportionably larger and that you wear a cap in truth my dear friend it might have been drawn for you and yet said lady horatia smiling mournfully this was drawn for a brother of mine who could i fear be no relation to our lovely friend here so strangely it happens that features coincide it is fortunate very fortunate for me madam said celestina gravely if this resemblance has had the effect of prejudicing your ladyship in my favour you have merit enough to justify it though i had conceived an affection for you without any introduction but we will talk no more of resemblances if such discourse makes us melancholy lady horatia then turned the conversation and the next day as the two little boys were by this time well enough to continue their journey they moved on about twenty miles together lady horatia begging for that day to have celestina with her while her woman went with mrs elphinstone to assist in the care of her children celestina who knew only in general that lady horatia was a widow of very affluent fortune who gave up much of her life to literary pursuits and literary connections and much of her fortune to the assistance of the unhappy now learned that domestic misfortunes had contributed with her natural turn of mind to estrange her entirely from those scenes where celestina had sometimes formerly seen her and that having lost an only daughter the last of her children of a deep decline she now tried to call off her mind from the subjects of her mournful contemplations by change of place and had never since that period resided long at any of her own houses but had passed almost the whole year in travelling stopping wherever she found a pleasant spot and often remaining several days or even weeks at some remote house she had once or twice she said engaged friends to go with her on these expeditions but had always found the difficulties they made so much counterbalance the pleasures they were capable of affording her that she now travelled alone some said she were tired and some were tasteless some were talkative and some were insipid you will certainly think me fastidious and perhaps i am so but indeed it is more difficult to find such a companion as suits me in every respect than appears at first view women of my own age who are established in the world cannot of course leave their families and connections those who are not 
are for the most part unhappy from pecuniary or family distresses and the mind depressed at that period of life has lost its power of resistance and sinks in that hopeless languor from which i often want to be myself relieved by cheerful conversation the young do not travel for prospects or enjoy cataracts and mountains they are looking out for lovers and are wearied when there are neither men to talk to or adventures to be hoped for i have tried two or three young ladies and found that as we had no ideas in common our conversation was soon exhausted and when i was near any place of summer resort or passed through a town at the time of a race or a music meeting their hearts were beating to enter into scenes which i was only solicitous to fly from do you know however that if i had not met you absolutely engaged on this scottish journey i should have been strongly tempted to inquire whether you would allow me to make the experiment once more where i am strongly impressed with an idea that i should meet with better success celestina answered that her good opinion did her the utmost honour and by degrees the tender and maternal solicitude lady horatia expressed for her drew from her the little narrative of her life lady horatia expressed the greatest aversion to lady castlenorth it is true said she i do not know her much from my own observation for she is a woman whose conversation i have always disliked and avoided but from some anecdotes of her that have been related to me by those who know her well i believe it may with truth be said of her as was said of a celebrated political character that she has a heart to imagine a head to contrive and a hand to execute any mischief willoughby is young open-hearted and artless by no means likely to suspect or likely to detect artifice so deep as what she is capable of and i am well convinced that there are no contrivances at which she would hesitate either to carry a favourite point or avenge its failure celestina was extremely comforted by this opinion given by so good a judge every other sorrow was comparatively light to that which she felt from the idea whenever it forced itself upon her mind that willoughby had through ambition or caprice or avarice voluntarily deserted her and every opinion that strengthened her own hopes of his unaltered affection and imputed his leaving her to the evil machinations of the castle north was soothing and consolatory lady horatia howard was now travelling towards edinburgh and made the time of mrs elphinstone her own for the pleasure she derived from her company and still more from that of celestina to whom during this journey she became so much attached that she made her promise to come to her whenever the abode she was now going to should be inconvenient or whenever she was under the necessity of changing it an invitation so flattering was gratefully accepted and lady horatia having shown both her travelling friends very polite and generous attention took leave of them with regret on their leaving edinburgh with elphinstone who was there waiting for them she gave celestina directions whether to write to her for the remainder of the summer and again made her promise to come to her in the winter if she left her scottish friends and at all events to contrive to pass with her two or three months of the next summer after taking leave of her a very tedious and very dreary journey of many days brought the elphinstones and celestina to the seaside where they were to embark for the isle of skye mrs elphinstone accustomed to see so many different countries was yet struck with dismay at the sight of the black and dreary heaths over which they travelled and in spite of all her attempts to sustain her courage she looked at her children with eyes where maternal anguish was too visibly expressed elphinstone however to whom novelty had always charms was not yet weary of his situation and he was as gay and unconcerned as if he had been leading his wife to the most beautiful estate in england celestina though very little delighted with the country they had passed through was determined to testify no dislike to it that might add to the painful dejection of her friend 
and by making light of the inconveniences of the journey and putting their hopes and prospects in the fairest light she supported her drooping spirits which the thoughtless and somewhat unfeeling vivacity of elphinstone himself served rather to depress than to support End of Volume 3, Chapter 1volume three chapter two a celestina this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by florence short celestina by charlotte turner smith volume three chapter two arrived at their insular abode after great fatigue mrs elphinstone recalling all her fortitude busied herself in making it as comfortable as she could and assumed at least the appearance of cheerfulness though celestina saw with concern that it was often but appearance celestina herself however whose mind had too long been unpleasingly called off from that object on which she best loved to fix it was far from being displeased by the perfect seclusion of the place she could now wander whole days alone amid the wild solitude in which she found herself listening only to the rush of the cataract which dashing through broken stones sparkled amid the dark heath on either side of it or the sullen waves of the ocean itself which on all sides surrounded her the ptarmigan bursting from its heathy covert or the sea-fowl screaming from the rocks were the only sounds that broke these murmurs but she found her spirits soothed by the wildness of the places she visited and far from regretting the more cultivated scenes she had left she rejoiced that since she no longer could hope to see willoughby she was released from the necessity of attending to any other person the immense distance that was now between them she sometimes considered with dismay but at others she remembered that distance only cannot change the heart she trusted on the long tried the long assured tenderness of her lover and was willing to indulge the soothing hope that they should meet again to be separated no more and that he was labouring to remove the fatal obstacle whatever it was that now divided them after having been above five weeks on the island a large packet arrived from cathcart it enclosed among many to his sister one to celestina from willoughby and this more than any she had yet received from him since his absence seemed to assure her of his unfailing attachment it was less confused than those he had formerly written and seemed the production of a mind more master of itself and though it did not speak in positive terms of his immediate return celestina fancied that many of the expressions alluded to that hour and her heart found this idea so deliciously soothing that she would not suffer her reason to deprive her of any part of the pleasure she found in indulging it a few of the residents of this and the neighbouring islands were by this time acquainted at the house of mr elphinstone the young and of young people their visitors principally consisted were all charmed with celestina who whatever was her inclination for solitude never refused to make one in the ramble of the morning or to join the cheerful dance of an evening elphinstone naturally good-humoured and particularly desirous of pleasing her soon became anxious to promote these parties which celestina whose heart was open to new sensations of pleasure since the receipt of willoughby's last letter did not decline not only because she found much in these remote regions to gratify her curiosity but because she foresaw that from the shortness of the summer so far north the days when these amusements were practicable were drawing to their conclusion and that she soon should be left unmolested to listen to the roaring of the waters and the sighings of the wind round the naked rocks against which it incessantly beat it was now the end of july and celestina had already visited jonah and several other islands sometimes these excursions had been made with mrs elphinstone but oftener without her elphinstone kept a boat which was always ready for the service of celestina and when his wife could not go with her a miss mcqueen a very agreeable young highland lady 
always made the third several little isles which afford no habitations for winter are scattered among the larger islands which are called the hebrides one of these lay within sight of elphinstone's house which was close to the shore at the distance of about a mile and a half it was remarkable for the grotesque form of the cliffs which arose round it and for a stream of the purest water that bubbled up at the highest ground and fell into the sea through a chasm of the rock celestina to whom elphinstone had shewn it laughingly called it her island and he in return had said that were she established on it it would become more dangerous than the island of calypso among other little plans of amusement which the decline of summer insensibly rendered more frequent it was agreed that on the first fine day some cold provisions should be taken and that they would all dine together on one of the natural stone tables in celestina's island a fine day was found the party which were mr and mrs elphinstone miss mcqueen and two gentlemen were ready when one of the boatmen who usually accompanied them was nowhere to be found elphinstone equally impatient and eager whatever was the importance or insignificance of the matter he was engaged in was going himself in search of the missing man when one of those who remained in the boat followed and told him that there was a young man a few yards farther on the shore who would take the place of him that was absent and that it was better not to wait elphinstone satisfied so long as his party was not interrupted accepted the offer and the boatman beckoning to the highlander who stood at some distance he ran towards them and was admitted into the boat the party now put off from shore the water was beautifully smooth the sky clear and the wind in their favour very little exertion therefore on the part of the men who were entrusted with the navigation landed them safely on the ilk it did not contain more than three acres of land and the sole inhabitant of it was a solitary herdsman whose temporary dwelling composed of loose stones turf and heath he had raised under the protection of a large cliff of grey slate that seemed to have started away in some strange concussion of nature from some other island and to have fixed itself as a sea mark amidst the perpendicular and abrupt rocks that fenced this on every side the spring burst out near its base and here the party sat down to make their gay repast when it was over the gentlemen went away and while the boatmen were at dinner pushed out the boat themselves and began to fish near the shore while celestina leaving the ladies together walked away alone to the western coast of the island the sun was already declining in an almost cloudless sky and gave the warmest splendour to the broad expanse of ocean broken by several islands whose rocky points and angular cliffs caught the strong lights in brilliant contrast to the lurid hue of the heath with which their summits were clothed and which on the northern and eastern sides threw a dark shadow on the clear and tranquil bosom of the sea the sea-birds in swarming myriads were returning to their nests among the ragged precipices beneath her and celestina recalling to her mind the green delights of alvastone its deepening woods gay lawns and airy summits compared it in pensive contemplation with the scene before her yet different as they were she thought that with willoughby any place would be to her a paradise and that even in such a remote spot as this she should be happy if it gave only a subsistence with him this train of thought a little indulged made her have recourse to her pencil and produced an address to him in the following sonnet on this lone island whose unfruitful breast feeds but the summer shepherd's little flock with scanty herbage from the half-clothed rock where osprey cormorants and sea-mews rest even in a scene so desolate and rude i could with thee for months and years be blessed and of thy tenderness and love possess find all my world in this lone solitude when the bright sun these northern seas illume with thee admire the light's reflected charms and when drear winter spreads his cheerless gloom still find elysium in thy sheltering arms for thou to me canst sovereign bliss impart thy mind my empire and my throne thy heart 
the broad orb of the sun was now only half seen above the horizon and celestina who had little marked the progress of time rose and hastened to join her companions as she turned for this purpose towards that part of the island where she had left them she saw the highlander who had been taken by chance into the boat in consequence of the absence of another start up from the ground at about two hundred paces from her where he seemed to have been concealed behind a cairn or pile of rude stones and hurry away towards the part of the shore where the boat had been left the incident however made no great impression on her mind but from the singular appearance of the man who was in a complete highland dress which is now not often seen and which made him as he walked very quickly on before her seemed exactly the figure a painter would have chosen to have placed in a landscape representing the heathy summits and romantic rocks of the hebrides she soon rejoined mrs elphinstone and miss mcqueen the three gentlemen almost as soon approached to tell them it was time to return and they arrived again at their home after a little excursion with which all seemed pleased though celestina had suffered some raillery for having so long deserted them every day now passed nearly alike diversified only now and then by the company of a stranger from some of the other islands and sometimes a party in the boat elphinstone was not yet tired by the project which brought him hither for to use an expression of his wife's which he uttered with a melancholy smile to celestina the new was not yet off he was therefore gay and alert persuaded himself by calculations which he made after his own sanguine manner that he was not only a benefactor to the public but should in a few years realize a great fortune by facilitating the capture of herons among the western islands of scotland the season for the proof of his exploits in this way was now rapidly approaching and he became every day more busy but his wife looked forward to it with less pleasure she languished for her little girls who were at the other extremity of england and thought with dismay of the tempests of winter which would shut her out from the little communication she yet had with that country but whatever was her regret she suffered it not to disturb the transient happiness her husband seemed to enjoy nor to communicate any gloom to the milder cheerfulness of celestina whose company was her greatest resource against that cold despondence which in spite of all her fortitude sometimes seized on her heart celestina had now been almost three months an inhabitant of the isle of skye and felt nothing unpleasant in her insular situation but the length of time that must always elapse before she could hear from willoughby or even from cathcart a second packet was however brought to mrs elphinstone from the latter before the expiration of the eleventh week of their abode with eager impatience it was opened celestina received her part of it with a beating heart but on unsealing it it found no letter from willoughby a letter in a hand which she did not at the moment recollect ever to have seen before attracted her attention and mingled it with something of terror she looked eagerly at the name and saw it signed with that of the elder mr thorold her spirit sunk was it some ill news of willoughby which he communicated that he might soften the blow she hurried it over in such breathless agitation as hardly gave her leave to understand what she read which was to this effect your old friend amiable celestina though he has only had one letter from you since you left him reminds you of himself once more and is sorry that like everything in this world his letter will convey to you a mixture of pleasure and pain my daughter arabella is married to her own wishes and those of her mother in point of fortune she has done well we cannot here obtain every thing i hope she will be happy and i am sure she will be rich which in the opinion of most fathers you know puts the former point out of doubt you will guess that mr bettinson is the gentleman who is now numbered with my family my wife has been gone with the new married couple some weeks to the seat of mr bettinson's father in norfolk you know i love home and i love that those who are less delighted with it should not be needlessly disturbed when they are out for which reason i have never communicated to his mother that montague 
after attending his sister's wedding here did not return to oxford as he talked of doing that i know not whither he is gone and have only had one letter from him since in which he assures me he is well and desires i would not be uneasy about him it is very difficult to be otherwise this eccentric young man makes me tremble for him perpetually having no clue to direct my guesses i have no conjecture where or with whom he is and think it better to say as little as i can about an absence on which a thousand unfavourable constructions may be put ah my lovely ward how fortunate it would have been if when his judgment directed his heart it could have been accepted where but this is wrong or at best useless farewell may heaven protect you and i pray you not to forget your most faithful friend e thorold relieved from her first apprehensions celestina felt extremely concerned at the absence of montague thorold so painful to his father perhaps so discernibly to himself she read over the letter again and fancied it very evident that mr thorold imputed it to some new attachment and giving a sigh to the recollection of all it must cost such a father to see such an unfortunate turn of mind blast all the acquirements of learning and all the advantages of genius she turned her thoughts to willoughby and felt with renewed poignancy the disappointment of not having heard from him another and another week passed without any intelligence and all the soothing hopes celestina had so fondly encouraged gradually gave way to fear and apprehension at length a second packet arrived it contained a letter indeed from willoughby but so far was it from confirming the favourable presages of the former that she saw in it only a prelude to the event which other information made her believe would soon happen the marriage of willoughby and miss fitzhaman lady horatia howard whose attachment to celestina had taken very deep root had written to her from london whither she was now gone and had told her with as much tenderness as she could that such was the general report among the relations of the family and what was generally believed in the world from the same channel she also learned that sir philip and lady molyneux were expected in england early in the ensuing winter and that a large house in portman square was fitted up in the most splendid style for their reception lady horatia concluded a most friendly letter to celestina thus but my dear miss de mornay however all these things may be let me hope that you will not hide yourself in the hebrides all the winter why should you talents and virtues like yours were never intended for obscurity come then to me and assure yourself of the truest welcome you need not apprehend meeting mr willoughby and his bride for it is understood that they are to remain some time abroad and before they return to england you will have learned to conquer those painful emotions which the sight of them now perhaps might give you your understanding sets you above the puerile indulgence which inferior minds claim by prescription towards a first love the man whom any common consideration could induce after having won your affections to desert you never could deserve you and if some insurmountable barrier is between you you will learn to consider him as a friend and consult his peace in regaining that cheerfulness which he meant not to destroy but which to see destroyed must overcloud his days however prosperous they may otherwise be there was in this letter more meant than was expressed and on considering it the wonder and uneasiness of celestina were redoubled but however obliged she thought herself by the friendly interest lady horatia took in her happiness and however just her arguments might be she felt no inclination to quit her present solitude and since she had now less hope than ever of meeting willoughby she had less than ever a desire to return into the world but gave herself up to that melancholy despondence against which hope in her own sanguine and cheerful temper had till now supported her to indulge this increasing sadness it was now her custom to walk out alone after dinner and to make for herself a species of gloomy enjoyment from the dreary and wild scenes around her 
a little time before she had been imagining how pleasant the most desolate of these barren islands might be rendered to her by the presence of her beloved willoughby she now rather saw images of horror the sun far distant from this northern region was as faint and languid as the sick thoughts of celestina his feeble rays no longer gave any warm colouring to the rugged cliffs that rose above her head or lent the undulating sea that sparkling brilliance which a few weeks before had given gaiety and cheerfulness even to these scattered masses of almost naked stone against which the water incessantly broke grey sullen and cold the waves now slowly rolled towards the shore where celestina frequently sat whole hours as if to count them when she had in reality no idea present to her but willoughby lost to her for ever willoughby forgetting her and married to miss fitz Hamond. she had more than once remarked in returning from her walks that a man who kept always at such a distance that she could merely discover to be a highlander seemed to be observing her yet as he never came near her and always disappeared before she got near the house she could not imagine him to be one of the people belonging to elphinstone but puzzled rather than alarmed by his appearance for which she could not account she insensibly ceased to notice him mrs elphinstone occupied as she was by her own domestic uneasiness was still most tenderly attentive to celestina and endeavoured to communicate to her some of that still and mournful acquiescence which served her in place of philosophy celestina had not yet suffered enough to learn it but she forbore to add to the melancholy of her friend by indulging her own while they were together and this restraint threw her more than ever into entire solitude though the autumn was so far advanced that the weather frequently drove her from the open hill or the vale under it to the casual shelter of some natural cave by the side of which the torrent increased by the storm hoarsely rushed and was answered by the roar of other streams whose hollow murmurs swelled in the gusts of wind that whistled through the mountainous tracks and compelled even the fowls of the desert to seek shelter where only it was afforded within the caverns of the cliffs or among the matted heath that clothed their summits the delicate the elegant the lovely celestina she whose talents would have adorned the most informed society and whose beauty might have given new lustre to the fairest assembly was thus a self-banished recluse in the remotest and most uncultivated part of the british dominions her wish now was to pass her whole life here in that sullen calm which she at length hoped to obtain and the rudest scene of these islands now appeared to her infinitely preferable to any of the pleasures lady horatia howard offered her since they could only serve to remind her of willoughby perhaps to shew her how happy he could learn to be united with another the frequency of storms now prevented many of those visits which had during summer a little broken for elphinstone the uniformity of solitude but it was the height of the season for catching heron and he was busy and for the present happy while his unfortunate wife who desolate as her present situation was yet dreaded the hour when this bustle should sink into discontent and give place to other projects received him on his return from those expeditions to other islands in which he was now frequently engaged always with cheerfulness which he did not or would not see was forced and sometimes with smiles which to everybody but him were evidently were the smiles of a stifled anguish celestina answered lady horatia's letter as it deserved but to willoughby she was determined not to write that trembling solicitude with which she had been accustomed to expect letters from him it was now she thought time to subdue for she persuaded herself that never again they would bring to her anything but anguish and regret and yet by those contradicting sensations to which violent attachments subject the human heart she incessantly indulged herself in thinking of all those happy hours which she had passed with him whom she fancied deserved little or no regret of whom she ought not to think at all and yet was so fond of recollecting that every conversation was irksome to her and every employment a task 
which took off her attention a moment from him chi perdo chi lasso non ti vedro più she repeated incessantly to herself sometimes with tears of tenderness and sometimes with those painful emotions of mingled anger and regret which press on the heart when pride and resentment are struggling with affection in other moods she reproached herself for thus cherishing this unhappy passion tried to recall those days of resignation when without hope of ever being his she yet preferred willoughby to all mankind and to dismiss from her mind for ever the recollection of the few weeks when he had awakened that hope and called forth all her sensibility only as it should seem to render her wretched then she exclaimed in her native language felicite passe qui ne peut revenir tourment de ma pensée que n'ai je de perdon perdu le souvenir in these gloomy moods she was quite unable to remain a moment in company especially in the company of elphinstone who with the true projector's infatuation fancied everybody else as much interested about the fishery as he was and persecuted her with details of how many buses he had out and how many laths they had taken what was the best method of curing them and of the superiority which a few years would give the fishery in which he was engaged over the dutch celestina began to dread the conversation and had it not been for mrs elphinstone of whose suffering merit she was every hour more sensible she would not have forborne to express her weariness and disgust a hearer was necessary to elphinstone and when he had nobody else to talk to this unenviable place was filled by the inwardly impatient celestina it happened however that she was released from this for some days towards the end of november elphinstone went to the isle of harry's on his business as he fancied and the wind being against his return she no longer listened to the method of curing herrings but returned to her shortened but less interrupted walks in one of these towards the close of a very lowering and cheerless day when her way was along the rugged cliffs that on the western side of the island hung over the sea she composed the following sonnet the pilgrim faltering and sad the unhappy pilgrim roves who on the eve of bleak december's night divided far from all he fondly loves journeys alone along the giddy height of these steep cliffs and as the sun's last ray fades in the west sees from the rocky verge dark tempests scowling o'er the shortened day and hears with ear appalled the impetuous surge beneath him thunder so with heart oppressed alone reluctant desolate and slow by friendship's cheering radiance now unblessed along life's rudest path i seem to go nor see where yet the anxious heart may rest that trembling at the past recoils from future woe End of Volume 3, Chapter 2